I am Cheryl Posner. I am a volunteer on the Book Festival Committee, and I'm just so happy to welcome you all here in person, live people. I feel nervous and happy and excited, so thank you. So before we get going with Andrew Graff, I would like to thank our supporters and sponsors, because even though this is a program of the, of the Marathon County Public Library, it would not happen without a lot of help. So, support for the 2021 Central Wisconsin Book Festival was provided through the Community Arts Grant Program, the Community Foundation of North Central Wisconsin, with funds provided by the Wisconsin Arts Board, a state agency, the Community Foundation, and the EA and Esther Greenheck Foundation. Support also provided in part by the Ruder Ware Law Firm, the Marathon County Public Library Foundation, Wisconsin Humanities, with funds from the National Endowment for the Humanities, CoVantage Cares Foundation, the Portage County Public Library Foundation, Macmillan Memorial Library, the Friends of the Marathon County Public Library, Marathon County Historical Society, which did open up specially just for us tonight. So thank you to them. Uh, Whitewater Music Hall and Yankee Bookstore. Uh, now, Andrew Graff has an interesting backstory. He grew up in Marinette County, having adventures in the woods, on the water, probably in the water, the Menominee River, I think. After high school, he enlisted in the Air Force, and after he did that, September 11th happened, and so he was deployed to Afghanistan. And after he finished his service, he came back to the States, returned to Wisconsin, was living in Appleton, studying to be a paramedic. He thought he had his life all worked out. And then he just had a feeling that he needed to take his life in a different way. So here to tell us all about it, about his journey, and about his really stunning debut novel, Raft of Stars, please welcome Andrew Graff. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl, so much. Everyone can hear me okay? All right, you can see me okay? I realize I'm kind of short behind this podium. Maybe I'll stand out from time to time. Uh, thank you so much um, for coming tonight. This is an absolute pleasure for me. Thank you to the Historical Society for this absolutely beautiful venue. Thank you to the library and the book festival for the invite. This is uh, fantastic. And thank you to Yankee Bookstores um, for, for being here and taking such good care of, of writers and, um, and readers. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I feel like I don't deserve to be here, but I, but I sure will take it. It's fun, you know? So uh, my hope tonight is to uh, fill about 40 minutes, um, and I want to let the book introduce itself, and then I will introduce myself. And then what I'd like to do eventually is work through uh, chapter one and also tell the story behind the story, uh, some of the inspiration for the writing and some of the, some of the best uh, writing advice that I've ever come across. So Raft of Stars, my debut novel out this year with Echo HarperCollins, begins with, begins with a note, a note left on a, left on a fridge for somebody's grandfather. And uh, it's only about one paragraph long, and I'd like to just begin by reading that. It's from one of the boys to a, another character, the grandfather. To Fish's grandpa, Fish had me put this note on your fridge to tell you we are running away. He says we're going to go find his dad. We'll mail you money for the sack of food we took from your cupboard, and the jackknife, and the two cups, and the pack of matches. Fish says to tell his mom, don't worry. We have my old man's gun and five bullets. We have our bikes and fish poles and a tarp and also a pouch of your tobacco and we'll send money for that too. Please tell the sheriff that fish didn't want to shoot my old man. My old man is dead in my kitchen on the floor by the table from Dale Bredwin. And with that note, off you go into uh, Raft of Stars. Raft of Stars is a book about two boys who are forced to flee into the, the north woods of Wisconsin. And it's also a story about the adults who pursue them. 
The two boys are named uh, Fisher Branson and Dale Bredwin. One has a cruel father, and the other um, takes things into his own hands to protect his friend, and that takes the cast of characters out into the woods. The boys are pursued by adults. Um, Miranda is one of, the, one of the boys' mothers. She's this uh, sort of fierce Pentecostal who's also pretty good in a whitewater canoe. She's accompanied by Tiffany, who is a purple-haired gas station attendant slash poet in the small fictional town of Claypot, Wisconsin. And they're also pursued uh, on horseback by Teddy, one of the boys' grandfathers. He's sort of a woods-wise Korean War veteran. If you're lost in the woods on a horse, you want a guy like Teddy with you. And uh, Teddy's accompanied by Sheriff Cal, the interim county sheriff. He's uh, a transplant to the North Woods, and he's doing a very, a very poor job of um, pursuing those boys through the, through the forest. As all the characters go downstream together and deeper into the woods, they seem to me to all be asking the question, um, are we going to make it? And not just in this wilderness or this woods filled with black bears and coyotes and rivers and storms, but are we going to make it in, in this life, uh, in these relationships, in this community, in this cosmos? And I like to think that Raft of Stars uh, by the story's end is a, is a book that answers that, hopefully. All right? So what I'd love to do tonight is, is read the first chapter. There's plenty of time. Um, but I'm not just going to read it straight through. I want to pause and, in between some of these parts and talk about the backstory of, of inspiration for the novel and the writing process and, um, and home. So first things first, in order to do that, I need to read a little bit of an, an author's introduction. This is a kind of an autobiographical letter that I was asked to write for the paperback, which is coming out um, early next year. So a sneak peek here. And this will get us into the story behind the story. So I was raised at the end of a dead-end road in the township of a village of 1,999 people. Or so said the sign by the road that led into the riverside town of Niagara, way up north in the fingertips of Wisconsin, with its towering bluffs and pulp mill and single building K through 12. I had a barn full of pigeons and a Siberian husky, two brothers and alfalfa fields, a cedar forest and the Menominee River. There are many good ways to grow up in this world, but this one was mine and I loved it. Of the landscape, I loved the river most, where it ran steep and tea-colored through a set of rapids named Piers Gorge, just west of the Highway 8 bridge, from which I've thrown many rocks. I live down in Ohio now. I'm a busy father and writing professor, but I still sometimes close my eyes and take long hikes alongside Piers Gorge. I can smell the cedars cross the two slippery wooden bridges over the tributary creeks, climb uphill, and hear the deep hum of waterfalls. The first words of Raft of Stars came to me by a river, the Peshtigo, which is a sort of a little sibling to the Menominee, sharing the same watershed and emptying into Lake Michigan. My wife and I and our first child lived in a house by the river, and I was busy building fires and painting rooms and grading papers for my first teaching job after graduating from the Iowa Writers' Workshop. I read one night an essay by Flannery O'Connor about physicality in writing, and I wrote a few lines about two boys pushing bikes down a country road, which later became the novel's opening scene. The view from our river house looked out onto a wide channel filled with a maze of islands where my son and I and his sock monkey liked to canoe and look for turtles. I knew the two boys pushing their bikes down that country road would somehow end up on a set of wooded islands like these, but I didn't yet know what in their lives would take them there. I didn't even know their names, who they were, or what they were like. So that, that mention of um, the essay by Flannery O'Connor that sort of sparked the writing of, of Raft of Stars was a really important bit of inspiration. I was, it was the dead of winter, about 2015, and I was lighting fires in the wood stove in my basement. And I was using to uh, light the fires old notes from college. I had kept like every note I ever took and every handout that was ever handed to me, and I stored them in these boxes. Anyone do anything like that? Yeah? Cool. Oh, I'm not alone. Good. 
I was hoping that they would ferment and someday grow into some like wonderful mushroom of knowledge, but I ended up, in reality, I ended up lighting fires with them on a cold winter day. But one essay I saved from the flames, and I, and I held it out, and it was, it was an essay called The Nature and Aim of Fiction by Flannery O'Connor. And there was something about the way that that essay had been introduced to me by author David McGlynn, who works at Lawrence University and teaches at Lawrence University. Uh, he's the one who assigned that essay. And he loved it so much, and he thought it was so central for any young person wanting to write books that I pulled it back from the flames that night, and I decided uh, to read it on the couch. It's in that essay that O'Connor, um, and many of you, I'm sure you, you, you are aware, O'Connor was this a, a, a major 20th century American writer, and she wrote uh, short stories and novels and also some really great essays on like how to write. This is one of those essays on, on how to write. And she puts forth these three pillars of creative writing that I have stuck with me and have informed everything. And, and they're simple, but they're inexhaustible. And her basic premise is that um, sh stories should be concrete, stories should be dramatic, and stories should be meaningful. And it sounds really simple, but it was so helpful. And when she talks about concrete, she was talking about how a writer should deliberately try to involve at least three of the five senses to bring something fully to life, fully to life on the page. She writes that the beginning of human knowledge is the senses, so the fiction writer should begin where human knowledge begins. And it just makes sense, right? We live concretely. How do I know I'm in Wausau? I smell, see, taste, and touch Wausau, right? Um, so if I want to give an experiential story to a, to a, a reader, what I need to do is offer the raw materials of existence. So I sat down that night for the first time in a long time um, for reasons that I'll, I'll share in a, in a little while. And I wrote, and I wrote about a half a page. And I wrote about two boys pushing their bikes down a road. I could hear those tires on the, gra on the gravel and the asphalt. And I wrote about the smell of ditch clover. There was that sense of smell. And I, and I also wrote about uh, a blackbird clinging to a blackbird, or, or, or one of last year's cattail stalks. And that later became um, the first scene, the opening scene of, of Raft of Stars. So as I read this opening scene in chapter one, and you hear things like clover, blackbirds, you see bikes being pushed down roads, just know like that spark came, you know, sitting on a couch in a cold winter night after feeding half of my education to the flames, you know? <laughs> Inspiration can come from just beautiful chance encounters. So here's, here's uh, part one of chapter one. The baby turtles the boys carried in the front of their shirts were the size of half dollars. Fish stopped on the asphalt and looked down into his shirt as he crossed the road from the field to the marsh for the fifth time. It was early June and the sun was hot and the turtles looked bothered and parched as they clawed in a pile. The turtles were tenacious which meant persisting in existence. That was a word fish knew from fifth grade. Fish's friend bread clawed up from the ditch clover, its lazy bees, and caught up with fish on the road. A red-winged blackbird clung to one of last year's dried cattail stalks. You know these are snappers we're saving, said bread. See them bony shells? We're saving snappers. The boys feared grown snappers like they feared Bread's old man. If there was one thing that could stop the boys in their tracks, it was the discovery of a full-grown snapper, how the thing reared up and hissed in that way that didn't seem right for a turtle to do. Turtles and dads weren't supposed to rear up and hiss. Fish looked down into his own shirt and shrugged. They don't look mean yet, he said. The asphalt road they stood on was quiet and old and bleached nearly white by the sun. It cut through marshes and drained marshes that had been long ago tilled into cornfields. The rooftops of the town of Claypot rose up from the fields a half mile away. The two sagging roofs of Bread's old man's house and mechanic shop butted up against the fields to the south. Fish hated that house and shop. But they'll get mean once they grow up, said Bread. Fish looked at the turtles again. It didn't seem right to judge them this early in life, the way they were nearly dried up and only just hatched. Poor damn things. 
That's something his grandfather often said when a calf was born a runt and couldn't eat, or a baby bird had fallen from its nest for the cats to find. The world was full of poor damn things. Sometimes Fish's grandfather looked at bread with the same kind of pity in his eyes, but then he'd seem to catch himself and say something about how grateful he was for bread's hard work that day and how he hoped bread would be back the next. Fish had seen the same look of pity in the eyes of the other grown-ups when they got around bread. He'd seen it in the eyes of the sheriff when he came around, and even the gas station clerk when bread trudged up to the counter in his ragged sneakers to buy a candy bar with money Fish's grandpa had given him. There was pity, but also wariness, like they were just waiting for bread to turn out, like his dad, waiting for him to pocket the candy and bolt. Bread was poor, and his dad was mean, but Fish disliked the way grown-ups looked at his friend. He didn't like what it did in his heart, how it made his friendship bear some sort of shame. I want to save him, said Fish. And I'm skipping ahead to where those boys do indeed start to save the turtles. Both boys were covered in cornfield dust up to their armpits from gathering the turtles, and the turtles themselves were white with it, like they'd been shook up in a bag of frying flour Fish's mom used to batter chicken halves. It was a dry spring. The tractors that dragged the soil smooth last week raised dust clouds that hung in the air for hours, a frigid winter with too much snow, and now a spring without rain. The winter was hard on the wildlife. When what snow there was first melted, the boys found three deer lying dead in the woods beneath a cedar tree, eyes milky and open. They looked as if the animals had grown too tired of the cold and decided to lie down for a while, amazed that a winter so cold could exist even this far north. Poor damn things, Fish had said, after hesitantly prodding one with a stick to prove death didn't bother him. On the opposite side of the asphalt road, the ditch met marsh water. The water was cold and dark with silt, and the wet bank seeped into the toes of the boys' shoes as they squatted down to free the snappers. As they lowered each leathery creature into the water, the turtles seemed awakened by it, the way the dust washed away, the suddenness of submersion. The turtles craned their little heads forward and waved their legs and swam away into the silt and water. They were like pigeons taking flight in pairs from the roof of Fish's grandpa's barn, aimless and erratic, surprised. So after I started uh, writing my way into this and, and thinking about the space that these boys inhabited, I started feeling pretty good about the concrete right, aspects of the story. I was like, yeah, yeah, 1990s Northwoods, Wisconsin, that's my jam, you know? Lived it, right? The, so the sights and sounds and smells the people, it's like, I, can, I, can, I, I think I can depict that world. But then, going back to that essay, The Nature and Aim of Fiction by Flannery O'Connor, she says, you need a second ingredient, and that's got to be drama, right? Drama. She, I love how she says it so simply. In stories, she said, something should happen, right? And I said, oh, of course. And it seems so obvious, but it's a lesson that I actually learned um, the, the hard way. And Flannery O'Connor even says, most people think they know what a story is until they sit down and try to write one. And then they realize how tangled a, a mess this is to balance. So the idea of drama um, is something that I, that I had to find. And it's a lesson I learned the hard way. Raft of Stars is not the first book I wrote. It's the first book that I published. So I spent seven years working on, seven years, working on a, on a previous manuscript. I started it at Lawrence University when I got out of the Air Force. I took it with me to Iowa. I worked on it then. At the, towards the end of my time at Iowa, an agent was even interested in it. And she and I started working on it together. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is working. Like, here I come, world, you know? And then when she finally sent it off to editors um, in New York, the, they responded. And the basic consensus was, hey, uh, you know, good writing in places, the characters seem real, but you have written a boring book. <laughs> a long, boring book, you know? And I thought, I did, didn't I? <laughs> like seven years, right? So I cried in my truck about that. Um, just north of Green Bay, actually, Highway 41, 
weaving through traffic, you know, <laughs> saying why to the clouds. But they were right. It was a boring book. I, would, I had like, at, in some places, these 17 page long chapters where two characters just sat next to each other and talked about like God, war, you know? That's not an exciting novel, you know? That's not a good story, so I knew if I was gonna, I took a long break from writing after that, about a year, and I didn't write anything until I pulled Flannery O'Connor's essay back from the flames. And I knew that if I was going to enter another long project that would probably last years, I wasn't gonna write a boring book. I was going to go out and find some good old-fashioned inciting incident, some drama that was big enough and loud enough to kind of carry that cast of characters deep into the woods. And um, for me, I don't know why, maybe it was because I was a new dad and I was asking a lot of questions to myself about what does it mean to be a father, a good father, what's it mean to be a bad father, what does, what does it mean to be fathered or parented in general. Can we, if, if we don't have parents, will the wilderness or life itself, will the community father us, parent us? So the main drama for me sort of landed on the character of, of Bread's dad. He would be the driving force, the spark that sort of disrupted the status quo and sent those characters out into the, into the woods. And here's a, bit of, here's a bit of him from chapter one. Some days, the boys made a game of dreaming up ways to rid bread of his old man. They sunk the man in the marsh once. Another time they tied him up in raspberry bushes and let black bears get him. They ran him down with countless trucks and tractors and they once buried him up to his neck in an anthill they found behind the barn. The game was a way of deadening the blows of bread's real life. Bread would come out to fish his grandpas for a few days at a time. He'd arrive with stories of falling down or crashing his bike, and his face and neck would get so red with shame that the bruises seemed to fade. Always, though, by the time he left the farm, the bruises had more or less yellowed. It wasn't every time, but it happened. One evening, when Bread spent the night, Fish overheard his grandpa talking with Bread on the porch, asking him how bad it was at home. Bread hardly answered him until Grandpa offered to go and talk to his old man, which Bread quickly refused. Fish overheard the talk from inside the kitchen where he filled a glass with water. He tiptoed to the porch door and leaned close to the screen. He just gets mad, said Bread. He's usually always mad. He drink every night, asked Grandpa. And after a pause, he ever mess with them guns when he's drunk? Hmm. Fish could smell the dust in the screen and felt a bad sort of envy about his friend. Fish's Grandpa spoke to Bread as if he were an equal. Fish hadn't experienced that. Ever since Fish started spending summers at his grandpa's farm, he sensed his grandpa was somehow ill at ease around him. His grandpa was strong and gentle and good, but there was a certain distance between them that never allowed them to talk about real things, big things. They could easily talk about baseball players, truck tires, or what needed doing around the place. But if Fish found himself crying in the hayloft, as he did often enough his first summer out, terrified by his new life without his father in it, he knew he was on his own. So he'd stop crying, finish his chores, wipe his face with his shirt and stride toward the house to announce his hunger for dinner. It once occurred to Fish that maybe his grandpa's distance was a kindness as well. A lesson from a boy, from a man to a boy about how not to dwell too much on things. Fish couldn't tell. It made him feel the way he did when he tried not to cry in front of boys at school. It was good not to cry. It was also awful. Look here, said Grandpa. I don't, I don't mean to get in your business, but just so you know how I know, my old man used to push me and my sisters around too. There was a pause. A heavy June bug attached itself to the screen near Fish's face and nearly caused Fish to reveal his presence. Fish's Grandpa stood reached for his pouch of tobacco. And I know how it goes if other people poke around in it, how it can make it all so much worse, so. But if you ever need a place to go, ever, you come right straight here. You run straight through the corn if you got to, understand? Yes, sir, good. 
The three of them sat in quiet, fish on one side of the screen and his grandpa and bread on the porch. The sun was all the way down now and the fireflies were starting to lift out of the grass and float past the apple trees, speaking silently about whatever it is fireflies have to say to one another. None of it means you can't grow up good, Dale, a hell of a lot better than your old man. You're gonna be a good one. You and Fisher are both gonna be good. He stood now, walked across the porch boards, spat chew over the railing, and adjusted the green fatigue cap that always sat on the back of his head, its stout brim skyward. Fish was pretty sure he got the hat in Korea, but he never asked. It never left his head unless he slept or used it to wipe sweat from his brow. You boys are good and strong enough to make it. You just keep going. Do you understand? Yes, sir. In the distance, a pack of coyotes announced their hunt. The yipping howls lifted into the night and fell away just as quickly. Plenty of hungry coyotes this year, he heard his grandpa say to change the subject. Plenty of hungry coyotes. Fish joined his grandpa and friend on the porch where he drank his water and watched the stars emerge in a new sort of silence. The stars hummed. Fish's blood hummed. The, blad, the bad envy was gone and a new light emerged. At Fisher's mom's church, congregants often spoke over one another. It's how they talked, spoken over, spoken to, words from the Lord, for a brother. Fish never minded it, but now he seemed to understand it. Bread and fish had just been spoken over. His grandfather knew that all was not well in the world, that it was a choice to bear it quietly, and something grave and peaceful rose like a moon in Fish's heart. So at this point in the story, I was feeling pretty good about the drama, and I was feeling pretty good about the concrete. I knew I had 1990s Northern Wisco in my pocket, and I could write about that. And I also uh, now had a, a, a primary drama, a cruel father that needed to be taken care of and it could cast those characters out into the woods. But the third and final pillar, this is the last sort of universal of storytelling that Flannery O'Connor talks about in her essay, The Nature and Aim of Fiction, is meaning. Stories should be meaningful. She says she'll, t she'll call anything a story in which specific characters, concrete, and events, drama, influence each other to form a meaningful narrative. So I started thinking about, well, um, what are these characters going to care about? What's going to happen to the human mind and heart of these characters and readers as they, as they go through this drama in this concrete space? And for me, again, that central question that these characters started asking was, am I going to make it in this relationship, in this community, and in this forest? And that question of, am I going to make it, um, is one that I was asking too as a human being as a new dad, as a new teacher, right? Am I gonna make it? And it landed for me in this, in this space. What became interesting to me, what became meaningful to me, was this balance between personal agency and acquiescence. When do I need to paddle really, really hard? And when do I need to have the wisdom to not try to change what I cannot change? That's something that, that's a really interesting question to me. It's still an interesting question to me. And if any of you haven't figured out, some of you do, far more than me, let's talk, right? Um, this is a, 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 a photo of me guiding a raft on the uh, Peshtigo River up in northern Wisconsin. This is another photo of me guiding a raft on the Peshtigo River in northern Wisconsin. I guided boats for like 12 years now. I absolutely love it. I started the year I got out of the Air Force. I just stuck with it. I haven't guided in the past two seasons because of kids and COVID, but I plan to get back in a boat um, when, I, when I can. And one of the things I love about Whitewater is not just the, just the thrill, and it is exciting, but I really love the art of, of when do you have to paddle very hard and when do you have to yield, right? Because ultimately you can't fight a whitewater river, but it's, you can learn to, to, to co-labor with it, co-labor with those forces. I love to watch the difference between real rookie river guides and really experienced river guides. 
and I'm, I'm neither anymore. I'm somewhere in the middle. But, the, but the, the rookies, the first season river guides, are all muscle and panic and overcorrection, and they'll take 15 strokes this way, say, oh, no, and then take eight strokes the other direction, right? And it doesn't usually go well, or they can hurt their shoulders, versus um, really experienced river guides who have just learned flow. Like I'm talking the ones with like big gray beards or beautiful gray braids coming out of their helmets. There's a, there is a guide down in West Virginia. She guides on the Gully River, which is one of the hardest rivers to guide in the United States. We're talking 14-foot waterfalls. I can't guide the gully. Um, they call her the gully goddess because she's one of the best river guides on that stretch of river. And I've, I've watched her in video coming down class five sections of water. I'm talking like house-sized explosions of white water happening around her. And she looks like she's sitting on a park bench, <laughs> eating a muffin, just cool as a cucumber, you know? She's learned flow, right? So that is something that I think all of these characters start to wrestle with, as they wrestle with the question of, am I going to make it in my own way? All of them, at some point, are paddling as hard as they can. And all of the characters throughout the course of the book, at some point, come up against the end of themselves and have to rely on something else or community in order to, to, to make it. So the question ultimately became, or the book became meaningful for me in this question. Are we just poor damn things, as Fish's Grandpa Teddy likes to say, right? Or are we more than that? Are we actually pretty strong? Are we actually good? And are we actually not not alone. That's how, the, that's how this story came, became meaningful for me, and I like to think that Raft of Stars answers that uh, in a hopeful way, in a positive way. So I would like to read, if I can beg your patience once more, just two more pages of Raft of Stars. And it's the closing of, of um, chapter one, and I think these ideas of, of agency versus acquiescence start to come through here for me. The side street leading to Bread's house was gravel. The town tore it up the previous summer to fix some pipes and never got around to repaving it. Bread said his math teacher said the roads and lots of other things would change for the better now that President Clinton was in office. All Fish knew about President Clinton was that he seemed to smile a lot and played a saxophone on the TV. Fish didn't know how much help a, a smiling man with a saxophone would be about a gravel road and clay pot. Fish's grandpa didn't know either. Bread's house was the last on the left. And while none of them were nice, Bread's house was the worst. It had peeling paint like the rest, but it seemed to peel back in a meaner sort of way. The siding curled away in places, revealing bits of pink foam board and blackened wood, like lips peeled back from bad gums and teeth. The grass was cut only when bread was there to cut it, and even then, only when there was enough gas to run the smoking mower. Overgrown lilacs grew against the window panes. His dad's shop sat adjacent to the house. Two buildings were separated by a weedy patch of gravel, stained black where his dad dumped oil pans. Halves of car transmissions and rusted motor blocks leaned against the cinder block shop. A flat-bottomed duck boat lay hull up across bald tires. And then Bread has to go home, and Fish has to leave him there and pedal home to his grandfather's house. The door to Bread's house rattled tight, and Fish pedaled as hard as he could down the gravel street. Every time he left Bread, he'd race his bike back to his grandpa's farm, trying to pray for help, or trying not to, until the quiet of the fields and fireflies offered its solace again. This time, though, something different happened inside him. This time, from somewhere or something, a reply seemed to come from all that stillness and sky. He couldn't hear it, but it was spoken somehow. This crystalline understanding, fish was the change being sent. It was loud enough to make him lock up his coaster brake in the gravel. Stars aligned overhead. The moon and the crickets waited. Fish clenched his fists on the handlebar tape. He wasn't going to leave bread this time. 
and the bravery of that thought seemed so foreign to him it was almost as if it belonged to someone else. But it didn't. It belonged to him. Maybe it was because he'd known bread for three summers, and bread had become more like a brother than a friend. Maybe it was because fish was 10 years old now and would turn 11 by fall, and there was a very big difference between the heart of a boy turning 10 and one turning 11. Maybe it was because he'd overheard his grandfather, a good, strong man, declare him good and strong. Something deep in his gut, something bright and dangerous and match-like made him stop on that road. And it felt right and made his heart hammer like it did when he rode out with his grandpa to kill coyotes. Fish looked out toward the marshes. Then he looked back at Bread's house. The moon witnessed the decision. Fish turned his bike around. And that's chapter one. Thank you all so much for this evening. Thank you so much. So, I believe... Yeah, I'm happy that I'd, I'd love to answer uh, any questions that you may have and then um, si sign any books that you may have brought. And if you need one, uh, we have some for, for sale as well. So I'd, love to, I'd love, love to hear your thoughts. Yes, please. I, I love this book. And I, I, I'm a kayaker in deep sea waters. And I really felt the, I love like Harry's and Ben's from his history in my house. Thank um, you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 I get it. And thank you so much for saying that. And that was a real problem that was on my mind. Like, what? Call in the helicopters, right? Um, in some ways, you know, 1994 in this fictional Northwoods County helped me. Um, I mean, one thing that 1990s helped me with was that no one was carrying cell phones yet at least where I grew up, you know? Um, which was lovely because one cell phone would just ruin this plot, right? Like, where are you boys? We're over here. Yeah. Book over, yes. So, but I, I definitely wanted to just, um, yeah, uh, let, the guard, let, let the guard come in at the end, but I wanted to see Cal and, and, and Teddy, and especially Miranda, uh, go after those boys. You know, once there was a, a boy lost in the forest, I knew somewhere there was going to be a mom and like no, no river, no black bear, no storm was going to stop her. So she was one of the funnest characters to sort of let loose in that woods and just let her rip, you know? Yeah. Thank you so much for reading it. Yes? I also really love the book. And if you can kind of imagine like a, a fictional teacher or a fictional character, tell you specifically, like, what do you think... Uh, what was his meaning that he took away from all of this? Maybe softening up a bit. Maybe at one point he mentions he wished he would have done more to help Dale. Like, what do you think someone like a character like that would sort of, what kind of meaning would he have yeah. in this experience? No, it's a wonderful question. I, I actually wrote um, a 19th chapter um, that took all of the characters. Uh, a half a six months into the future and just sort of see where they all landed, you know? And I think that was an important thing to write for me to figure out like how to aim them earlier on. But I think also the editors wisely said like, no, just end this on the river, you know? So I'm thankful for that. But I, I think Teddy was wrestling through questions of, of uh, you know, there's that scene where he and Cal are hanging out having coffee and he's like, 
No, I didn't like farming. I never did. I just went along with it. So he, I think Teddy was pushing back sparks, you know? And I think his reluctance to help Dale sooner was one of those things. I think, I think, I think the new Teddy, like Teddy in six months, would have, would have helped Brad sooner. Yes, please. Thank you, Andy. I love your book, too. Thank you. One of the things I was thinking about, you know, after the short and alarming introduction to Roman Fish, is that, you know, very deliberately, you start the book with two little boys performing an act of great kindness with lots of little beans that they think might bite them when they shove them down into their shirts. And, you know, I won't have kids, but I think a lot of us, you know, some of us might think that little boys Yeah, I think, well, the, when the turtles came in, they sort of made sense. Those turtles are released, and they are, they are, they are all alone out there, and Fish doesn't know whether to pity them or, or, or celebrate them. And the turtles are also tenacious, right, and, and striving. And they're also surprised and flying away in this erratic manner. So the turtles became sort of a microcosm of this, what would become the boys' uh, own story. But when I thought about those boys, I mean, I, I honestly just thought a lot about my own childhood growing up in, in northern Wisconsin and what kind of thoughts did I think and what kind of trouble did I get into with my friends, you know? Um, I grew up jumping my bikes and, and catching every turtle I could lay my hands on and lighting off firecrackers in silos, you know? So it was fun to, it was fun to think back to what those relationships were like. And, um, and there was a, plenty of tenderness in, in that too, you know? I remember playing with friends and we would all, everyone would play until someone cried, right? And then we would make up five minutes later and we would play again. So I think those 10 year olds were fun characters because they, they, they fought, they rallied easily, you know? And they felt really well, they felt loudly. I think kids are better at emoting than adults are, you know? So, the adult characters just had to stuff it all in and be miserable in canoes for a couple of chapters, but the boys could let it rip a little more, you know? Yeah. Yes? This is maybe like a weird question, but like, so you um, grew up in uh, um, terrain, sort of like what is in your book. Uh, I, I wonder, do you, when you were working on it, was it like, um, did you get it out of your head? Or did you like ever find that you wanted to like go and go into the woods area and think about like, all right, if they need to traverse this amount of space, what would they do or whatever? Do you know what I mean? Like, did you, yeah, I do. Did you go to places? Um, I, I was closing my eyes and walking along trails and, and going down rivers a lot as I was trying to write scenes. Um, the actual landscapes are sort of an amalgam of, of real landscapes from from Brilliant, Wisconsin, which is my wife's hometown, a lot of marshes. The, the actual road from the opening scene is based on a road near, that, that's the visual I had in mind, you know? And then I moved further north and I started um, plucking bits and pieces from the Piers Gorge territory um, near Niagara, Wisconsin and Norway, Michigan. And then I moved further north when I wanted bigger hills and bigger waterfalls all the way up to like the Porcupine Mountains area um, in, in the UP. So. I, I enjoyed walking down real rivers again, you know, r alongside real rivers while I was thinking and while I was writing. That was an enjoyable place to spend time for me. But I also wanted to um, make a fictional county, Marigami, so that I could let it rip and let the, let the uh, waterfalls be a bit bigger if I needed them to be, which I did, you know? So, yeah. Does that answer your question about, okay, thanks. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Andrew, so um, I haven't read your book yet, but it's been on my to-read list for a really long time, well, since it came out. And uh, what I'm curious about, you know, the writing process, and was there any major setbacks during, uh, you know, when you wrote this book, and kind of, you know, generally or specifically, uh, how you kind of overcame those? 
Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I mean, I shared the one about the seven-year novel that came back. It was a hard no. You know, that was pretty devastating. And then I worked on Raft of Stars for five years before, um, before it finally was, was picked up by an editor. Uh, in between that time, there, there, was, there, there were some difficult um, spaces where I didn't know if it was going to go again, you know? When I finished the manuscript and I got to a space where I thought like, yeah, yeah, I'm excited to share this. I gave it to an agent again. And um, there was a lot of back and forth at first between agents about whether this was adult fiction or young adult fiction. Because there's, there are young protagonists and it's heavily plotted, sure, right? But there's also like, you know, Sheriff Cal and, and Tiffany and adult concerns and interiority. So it actually got passed back and forth between agents um, four different times. And each time they would say, nah, this isn't adult fiction. Can I show it to a young adult person? I'm like, well, sure, please do. And then they would have it for several weeks or even a month or two. And then they'd, they'd say, ah, this isn't young adult. Let's give it back. So we'd try to shape it again, you know? I eventually, I tried to push it more thoroughly into adult fiction by adding more, uh, you know, interiority, like letting the concerns of the adults take up more time on the page. But to, to answer your question succinctly, there was a point when uh, one, two, three, four different agents said, I don't think so. And we just shelved it. And I thought to myself for about five months, like, oh my goodness, I did it again. I wrote another uh, sock drawer novel, you know? I'll try this a third time, but it's, it's getting harder, you know what I mean? Um, and then out of the blue, uh, one of the, the agents said, there's a brand new agent here. Uh, she really loves it. Would you like to talk to her? I was like, yeah, absolutely. I would love to. And she and I worked on it for a month and she, and she sold it in, in two weeks. Just amazing, you know? Um, once again, acquiescence versus agency, right? Like how I worked, you work so hard towards something, but ultimately it's, it, it baffles me how much it was out of my hands, you know? How much control I couldn't possibly weave into it. So keeping the faith, that's what David McGlynn, my old professor at Lawrence always said. He's like, you keep the faith. you like, you push through those dark nights of the soul. You know what I mean? And I did. He actually said to, he always said, tells it, he told our, our graduating class of, of writers uh, at Lawrence, he's like, you guys, it's probably going to take about 10 years to do this, to, you know, to maybe go to a grad program or at least to write a bunch of novels and, and, and fail to sell them. It's probably going to take 10 years. And part of me in my mid-20s was like, maybe it took you 10 years. <laughs> you know what I mean? I did think that. I was, you know, I was like, I'm going to do it in not 10 years. It, I graduated Lawrence in 2009. I, I, I sold this in 2019. I took every one of those 10 years, you know? So I love going around and saying that David McLean was, was spot on and right. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Waiting for us, you know, and, and are we going to be safe? Are, you know, and, and so it was also just so interesting to hear you reference Flannery O'Connor, right? You know, this seems like the um, kind of, a, and it's just so, it, it, it's what makes the adult definitely um, literary fiction and adult fiction in my mind when I, when I read it, was the, the weightiness of that, um, that unspoken waiting for father. Yeah, well, thank you so much for, for saying that. Flannery O'Connor is definitely a big influence on me. I love her work. She was a, a very devout Catholic, right? And wrote some of the best short stories. But she also wrote about hard things, you know? She wrote about very hard things. She wrote about real life in real ways. Uh, she didn't pull punches. Um, but there was always, a, there was always an, an uptick of, of hope in her stories. And I, I knew 
fairly early on that I wanted to push toward that sort of storytelling myself, you know? Marilyn Robinson said at the 75th anniversary of the Iowa Writers' Workshop, gloom is all the rage today, you know? <laughs> and, and I think in some ways, yeah, she's right. And, and what was sort of in vogue for a long, long time in storytelling or short stories was just if you can damage your characters and push them off into an abyss at the end, you've made art, you know? And Marilyn Robinson always kind of wagged her finger at that, and, and I was thankful for it. She said, no, it's actually pretty complex to, to go up to the edge and then try to be good, you know, to try, to try to turn things. So I knew I wanted to write a story um, that had that, that hopeful core to it, you know? Life's hard enough, and if I'm making stuff up, I might as well make stuff up that provides possibilities, you know? But uh, yeah, thank you, for, thank you for saying that, and I think those concerns did help. Pursuing those aspects of the story helped kind of push it toward a more adult uh, novel. There were times I had to pull things back, too, like writing through the eyes of 10-year-olds, you know? There was one scene in particular where I had, I had fish at one point on the riverbank, like giving some grand paillon to the meaning of life and everything like that. And the editor very wisely said, like, why don't you just have them think about the black bears again, you know? <laughs> I'm like, yes, yes, because 10-year-olds don't write essays in their heads, you know? So, yeah, thank you. Did you have a question? Yeah. Yes. And I suppose that was resulting in the last chapter that you You know, that is a question that I have been asked um, three times. Three different readers have, have said, they said, what about the horses, you know? And honestly, I just, like, I was just admit I dropped that ball. I'm just, like, the horses probably got walked, you know, back to town somehow. But, yeah. I don't know. I was, I was so concerned with the boys and how they ended up that the horses just kind of fell away. But you are not alone in asking that. Multiple people have said, like, what about the horses? Yeah. yeah. I, I like the bear. The bear showed up at just the right time. Mm. I really like that. Thanks so much. If I ever do a sequel, I'm going to take care of those horses. <laughs> yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, I would, I would say so. And again, sort of like how the landscapes were an amalgam of real places, but also very fictional. Uh, I think a lot of the characters were, you know, amalgams of real people, but also very fictional. So there's no one character I can point to and say, this is based on this person. But I do think the, um, you know, uh, the, the mothers, the, the gas station attendants, the, the grandfathers in particular, were the types of grandfathers and gas station attendants that were part of my life back in the 90s in the Northwoods, you know? Uh, Tiffany in particular, and they all came from, from me as well, you know? A, a part of me was in every single character, like the small town gas station attendant with purple hair who wants to be a poet. There was part of myself in that. Um, the thirty, the, the mid-30s sheriff who's questioning his identity and his his, his job and saying, do I really want this, you know? Or did I just inherit this idea from a, my, my family? I, I've gone through some of that myself, you know? But I met a real life Tiffany um, not too long ago. I was driving through rural Ohio and I stopped at this, it was this tiny town, just a couple of houses and a gas station. I stopped in at the gas station and I got my drink and I came around to the corner and there was a, was a woman in her early 20s with bright purple hair behind the counter. I nearly said, like, Tiffany, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, want, I thought for maybe two seconds about asking if I could take a picture, but then I thought, how weird would that be for her? You know, like, I wrote this book, and you're in it, and can we do a selfie? And then I thought, no, 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 just buy your, buy your water and get out of here. But, but Tiffany's are real, and Teddy's are real, and, and Miranda's are too, you know? So... I was, yeah, pulling from a lot of experience. So speaking of real characters, so fish and bread. Yeah. I can imagine it's hard to write 10-year-old boys, and I thought that they were so authentic, and like, I could look, see them. Thanks. The voice sounded real, and I was never, I was never in a place where I'm like, let's see. But I also think the part of why they felt so real is they had names that were fish and bread. I don't know if I would identify or seen them as clearly in my head 
So I'm wondering. <laughs> That's interesting. Had they always been fish and bread in your head? Were they ever like a Taylor and Morgan? They were always <laughs> they were always uh, fish and bread. Yeah, yeah, throughout. In fact, when in, when the book was in manuscript stage for years, it was just called Bread and Fish. That was the title, you know. And then, um, fortunately, like editors and agents were like, "Let's come up with something better," you know. Um, so it was it was it was a fun process. Those two names stuck with me, or, or resonated, or worked for me, um, for two reasons. One is they have they they do remind me of of the scriptural story of Christ feeding the thousands bread and fish. So this idea of miraculous provision, um, there is miraculous provision in this story. Like the characters come up against the end of themselves. Will someone or something be there? You know, so I was, I was, I was exploring that idea in the book. And I also liked their names because of how simple they were. It's like the most simple sort of meal bread and fish, and I wanted to write a, a, a very simple sort of elemental novel, with, by which I mean just like rivers and pine trees and wood smoke and stars, you know, so their names sort of fit there and they stuck, but I'm glad they felt real, and I'm glad what they said felt real. Again, um, some, some of that, much of that perhaps was having good readers and good editors saying, I don't think a 10-year-old would know that word or say that thing you know so yeah yeah your your 10 year old is suddenly like a, a 39 year old yeah <laughs> but they were fun to write that's for sure yes no yeah it can't take 10 years so i i will i will share the happy news so i have a second book um, in the works that's under contract with Echo Harper Collins again. And I got a, yeah, thanks. It's great, fun. So I'm working hard on that, and um, I think I owe them a first draft by the end of next summer. So I've got time, but I don't have 10 years. Thank goodness. You know, I don't want to do the decade uh, again. So, yeah. Has this one uh, ever been an interest in optioning? Characters, it's a heck of an adventure. It just seems like it would make for a great movie or a great yeah. series or anything like that. Man, I, there is. Okay. Yeah. And it's it's there's nothing there's nothing definite, but there has been interest in the and in they're they're um, putting their feelers out and having discussions in a realm that I know nothing about, you know? That's like west of the Mississippi territory. I'm just hands off, you know. But um oh how fun would that be? Yeah, yeah, I would, I would absolutely love to see it made into film. That would be so exciting. Yeah. Well, I'm sure we could cover your questions <laughs> all on that. Uh, I guess we'll probably end it there. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.